Da -da. Let there be light, and a lot of lights are here. So I'm quite sure that everybody who is here is also a light magic, or at least light fascinated. And it was a pleasure for me to read the descriptions of these two people here who are holding the next talk, uh, because he wrote, obsessed with everything that creates light, noise, motion, and smoke. And if you are going through the camp uh, in the night, you see it's like a big trippy uh, surrounding where every nerd feels very likely at home. So give a warm welcome to our next two speakers, Tim Becker and Matthias Krau. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the welcome. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Tim, this is Matthias. Um, we have to start off with a disclaimer. If you're hoping for like the exciting, blinky, colorful uh, light sharks with freaking laser beams on their heads, this is a boring lights only talk. Um, this is about sort of like office illumination, solid, uh, boring lighting. And uh, we have appropriately ugly slides. Um, and we're going to start with sort of the way that you do things, a little bit about us. We're uh, press every key, we do embedded hardware, um, very eclectic projects, everything from um, working on, um, with, with interactive artists on, on stage setups to working with banks with uh, chip cards. And this year, um, or last year and this year, we had a lot of light projects. So light with uh, little photo cubes to, to do product photography. Um, human-centric uh, light, light setups and um, a DALI protocol implementation for very high like precision museum lighting that, that, have, that are very precise in color. Um, and all of these sort of things about LED lighting, we learned a lot about LED lighting and we kind of created our, uh, our own, um, started creating our own LED lightings and we kind of wanted to share the things that were hard to learn and, and the things that are obvious to people who are in the business and um, if you're interested in designing lamps and lights, this is sort of the, the talk for you. I don't know how much, do, you, do any of you have anything to do with lighting, like industrial desktop lighting lamps? Okay. Um, so, with, as with most technology, there's drivers like, you know, defense industry and space. With lighting, that was more or less EU bureaucracy driving, uh, driving innovation in lighting uh, in the last couple of years. This, um, Regulation 244-2009 is the thing that caused normal incandescent lights to become obsolete five years ago in 2012. And people really hated that because the replacement were the CFLs, um, which is compact fluorescent light bulbs, um, the stuff that you would commonly known as shitty energy saver bulbs, the stuff that like take a long time to turn on. And people are trying to, and they make shitty light, they contain mercury, and people are really just against using those. And there's still, this was from a week ago in Berlin, people are still selling like rests, uh, rests of, of, of normal light bulbs because people really want to have them. Um, or people tried to sell them as heat globes and things like that. Um, and it took a while that, because CFLs suck, halogen will also, is also gonna be illegal, or won't be sold from next year on. Um, LEDs weren't really there yet because they were expensive and, and for a very long time you couldn't really produce, technically couldn't really produce white light with them. Um, but they are becoming more and more, uh, um, more and more viable as an alternative. There's this thing called Hate's Law uh, where you can see that in this, on the one hand there's a trend of um, LED, white LEDs being able to produce more lights exponentially and and at the same time, just getting cheaper and cheaper, and if you measure it as light per watts. Um, so in 2012, normal light bulbs were outlawed, and all of a sudden people were confronted for the first time for what it means to have really shitty lights. And that spawned a new trend in, in sort of the lighting industry, which is human-centric lighting. And this is really like if you go to light conferences or something, that's that's what it's all about. That's what all the big manufacturers of lamps are pushing now. And if you look at this Google Trends line, it starts basically when 
when normal when incandescent lamps become uh, obsolete. Um, of course, it's not a new thing, right? I mean, this efflux thing, a lot of people have that here that changes the color temperature of your light and is supposed to help your sleep cycle. That's human-centric. Obviously, there's, I mean, light is the biggest technical intervention in the normal state of things, so it really it messes with your physiognom physiognomy, bah, whatever. Um, but it, um, you know, it has an effect on your sleep and light cycle. It's, it's used as therapy for depression. There's, um, this is, it, it's not a new or esoteric thing that light can, ha can influence your well-being. Um, so for the, for the remainder of the talk, we're going to go into a little bit of LED technology, how to choose LEDs, um, the pros and cons of LEDs, and then go over to the sort of measures and um, uh, color rendition, color temperature, things like that, explain a little bit of how to read a data sheet and what these things mean because it's a little bit of abstract. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about protocols and then we'll demo our, uh, our, our lighting solution. So we'll start off with the, um, with the LEDs. These aren't typically the sort of LED that you would use in, in lighting. We just had it as a, because Japanese writing is always funny. Um, well, so LEDs have a number of, of, of advantages and disadvantages can, uh, dealing with, uh, compared to incandescent uh, lights. Uh, so in the main thing, they are much, much more efficient. So with the same amount of energy, you can just produce much, much uh, more light. They don't produce, they, they don't convert nearly as much energy to heat. They do produce some heat, and which is problematic on the con side because um, they tend to degrade themselves. If, if, if the hotter they get, the more uh, the, their, their, their quality degrades. Um, they have a much longer life than normal incandescents or even fluorescents. And that's not just in total hours of operations, but like a normal light bulb, when you turn it on and off, the cycling really physically affects it and, and causes it to break down. LEDs, basically, this number of cycles isn't, uh, isn't at all problematic. But with time, they, they get less bright, which normal lighting tends not to have as much, and the color that they produce changes. So if you change one light bulb out of several, it will look completely different because the other ones have already degraded and they're not as bright anymore. Uh, compared to, especially compared to the compact fluorescents, um, they're a lot less harmful. There's no mercury in them, uh, there's no glass typically when they break, uh, and they're operated at a lower voltage. But there are some new uh, harmful possibilities there. Um, there's something called blue light hazard, which, which previously was never really um, a thing because normal lights, uh, when they produce blue, will also produce a lot of ultraviolet light. The sort of damage ultraviolet light causes to your eyes is a lot more extreme than what blue light causes, but um, LEDs can, cause, uh, can, can create very pure blue light which also causes the uh, retina to degrade in a way. And that's something that never happened before because you could never really isolate blue light like that. Um, they're very fickle in the production process, so if you, if you create a dye of LEDs in the factory, depending on where they are on the dye, they'll behave differently. So, they, so even one batch of LEDs will have different colors and you have to be very precise in, 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 in picking the hardware. Um, cost, we said, is going down. Um, but there's still... Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, this is not only the cost of the device itself, but usually LEDs require something around them, some, some, some controlling, some cooling, uh, like a circuit around them, which makes them inherently more expensive than any solution that is just a, well, glowing wire. No. Well, that was already a current control, yeah. and I think you're, uh, <laughs> this is your start. Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway. Um, Do you want to...? Um, yep. Uh, who of you is, is, is into hardware, it's like doing electro electronics engineering, uh, has read data sheets, stuff like that? Okay. Um, uh, so that's, um, uh, we want to look into a data sheet of an LED. It's actually the LED that we're using. Um, the, um, and these data sheets are amazing. Like for every electronic component, you get very, very detailed descri descriptions of how their characteristics are. Um, and this is the typical thing that you have on every, almost every uh, electronic device, every electronic uh, component. Um, 
uh, the absolute maximum ratings is like um, there's some maximum current that you can can shoot through these LEDs. If you shoot, if, if you do it continuously more than 180 milliamps, it's gonna die at some point. Um, there's a small pulse. You can give it some something slightly more, uh, slightly more uh, power for a short period of time, and there's a maximum power that it can well can handle. Um, if you exceed one of those in the list, it's gonna well, probably gonna gonna uh, not be in the safe area anymore. Um, and you have operating temperature, so the maximum operating temperature with the surrounding temperature is 85 degrees. Um, that sounds like a lot, but it's actually if it's if the lamp is in an enclosure and there's heat around it and like like a warm environment and uh, you don't have possibilities to cool it, it's actually not that far. Um, there's a storage temperature, so yep, it's just slightly more. Um, and there's a, all a, a thermal resistance for power components that, that tells you um, how it behaves, like, like how much warmer the device will get than the, the, the environment, and you have to, have to reduce this thermal resistance in order to get the heat out of the device, which is, uh, for this LED, is not a critical issue. This is a mid-power LED. For higher high power LEDs, you need to, well, need to do terrible things to, to or slightly, uh, slightly bit more effort to get them into a range where they don't destroy themselves. And um, uh, yeah, and there's, there's uh, usually um, a range of how, how to solder them and what's the maximum temperature. Um, even these are the absolute, absolute maximum ratings. Even with the max temperature, die temperature of 150 degrees, you're going to degrade the, the LED. It's not going to die immediately, but it's, it's, be, it's going to be worse. Um, and these are the typical things that you see for an LED, hopefully see for an LED in a, in a data sheet. Um, there's something called luminous flux. We're going to going to see what's that in, in, in a second. Um, you see the forward voltage, which ranges quite a lot. Um, so you cannot control them. With, you can just simply take a voltage and put put it into them. Like some of them will not light up at all, and some will just die because it's too much for them. So you need to take the current that was shown in the last in the last page. Um, there's usually a, a viewing angle, angle. LEDs are typically or they're they're inherently directional, which means um, there is a range of 120 degrees, and at the front, there's the maximum uh, light intensity going out. And at these sides, at 60 degrees left and right, there's going to be half of that intensity. And uh, reverse current just says, uh, this is, it is a diode, but it's a terrible diode. Don't take it as a diode. So um, for me, all of these like luminous flux, those are all these weird, very abstract things that, like the previous slide, temperature, voltage, those are things I can relate to. But luminous flux color rendering index, where things were, for me are just don't really understand. So we're going to go into yeah. some of those. There's, uh, there, there, there's one more thing that I'm uh, that is not on here, which is the color temperature. Uh, that's because it's it's tight. It's in the title of the document. Um, um, one thing to mention is. Um, some LEDs are, um, uh, there are some units of, of, the, of sort of brightness or light amount, um, and they're often confused. Um, so get short, let's get shortly over this. Um, lumens is like, there's, this is the LED, and it emits light. And the, um, the total amount of light that goes out, like the, the, the sum of it, that's the luminous flux, and it's, uh, the unit is lumens. And that's, by the way, the important thing that you need to look for if you're choosing an LED. Um, there are some LEDs that are just called super bright. It's like uh, if you look for on eBay, like super bright LEDs um, means nothing. Um, and there's candela, which is the amount of light going into a certain direction. Um, this does not mean that, that that has nothing to do with the amount of light. If it just means that it's narrowly focused. So if you have a flashlight and focus it further, you will increase the candela, but not the lumens. Um, so it just means it's directed. And uh, like bad LEDs have this, this thing because it sounds better, but it's um, usually, usually wor worthless. Um, and then there's luminance, which is the amount of light that hits a certain area. Uh, and that's something you measure, like the brightness here that I'm standing on. That's about may maybe 1,000 lumens, uh, maybe 1,000 lux. And down there, there's 100 lux, something like this. But it's, it's rather the brightness of a room or a situation and not uh, the brightness of a light emitter. So lux is the unit that you use to see how bright your desk, your work environment should be. Candela is to see how well your, how well your spotlight is working, and, and lumen is what we want for LED. By the way, for, this, for is, this is wrong. This should be lumens per square meter. Ah, fuck, I didn't. No, doesn't matter. 
Okay. Um, Brightness. Nature, yeah. Nature, unfortunately, nature made it not that easy. Um, there's some, uh, there's like um, amount of light and there's the perceived brightness that we judge our brightness on. And the relation is not linear. So if you have a light with, say, 10 lumens and another light with 20 lumens, you wouldn't judge this 20 lumens light to be double as bright. Uh, in fact, um, this is an exponential curve, and this makes it far more difficult to, to build dimmable LED systems. Because in order to, to get the, the lower end smooth, uh, you need a wide dynamic range. And this is just because our human perception is made for wide brightness ranges, like from the night, uh, where there's less than one lux, to sunlight, where there's about one million lux. Um, so we have to cope with it. So just to illustrate that, um, black circle, white circle, um, this should be the thing around it should be perceived as medium gray. I don't know how it's in the in the presentation now. Uh, in fact, medium gray is only 18% of the light that emits from here. Um, so you need to go have a very high dimming range, which makes electronics and control more difficult. That was the first unit brightness. Um, something that many people still know is color temperature. You, you've probably seen cold white LEDs and warm white LEDs. And this is measured in carbon. Um, behind this, there's a black body line, and this is the, the um, light that a glowing black, idealized black body would emit at this temperature, which is very theoretical. It's just like, um, look at this line. It's like low, low value means warm light, and high value means cold light, which is that's a higher temperature, and that's colder. Um, this is just the way the black body glows. Okay, so I take this one. Better? Yeah. Um, by the way, where we're at it, this is the uh, CIE Uniform Color System, um, and that's something we're going to see again. This is, uh, don't take the colors seriously. Actually, what we see is just this range. That's the full spectrum we see. This shows all the colors that, we, um, that, that can be produced. At, like, at this, at this uh, surrounding, there are the, the intensest color is like the only one wavelength of the spectrum. Um, and like this is the mixed color. And this is like uh, the blown line. It's like from the, the violet. It's just a mixture of blue and red, which is not synthesizable. I think one of the things that for me is really confusing is the theoretical black body that also already sounds kind of like science fiction. But basically, there's a concrete black body, which is a normal light bulb. So, and and this, these are actually the colors. If you if you heat metal up to these temperatures in Kelvin, that's more or less the the glow that they that they would have. There, it's not exactly that, but it's very close to this. So, like the the tungsten and in incandescent light bulbs, two thousand seven hundred, like around here. And it's um, a yellowish. It's tone. a yellowish light, and that's because the tungsten inside is is just that temperature. No. Okay. And all of these all of these units are set up around that. They're from so the CIE thing is from 1931. 1931. Um, and they just a lot of this is just arbitrary things that they determined it through experimentation at that time. Um, uh, one more thing about this. Um, these are the. Does this work? N not work anywhere. Oh, okay. Um, so may um, uh, like a, like a big chart of all colors in, in our perception. Uh, uh, but McAdams showed that where our, our perception is, um, is, uh, uh, has various um, abilities to distinguish between colors. So in this, like this is like, it's, it's, it's enlarged, but um, this is a range where we are in the green area, we cannot distinguish colors good. Um, here, the ellipses are small, where we can distinguish different colors really well. And you see that the, the goes through an area where we're well able to distinguish between colors. So we have to be careful and we have to be very precise on that. Um, this is not absolute. We're not good at judging difference in absolute ways, but in relative terms, like if you compare two like each other. Which is problematic for the degradation and for the next... Uh Slide basically yep. for, for that, that they're not very, uh, LEDs aren't very precise. So if there's two that are slightly off, you notice it. So uh, in the data sheets of good LEDs, you will see this. And um, this is how the manufacturer just binned, like tested each and every LED and measured each and every of the, those and put them into different bins so they can order just lights from this area 
um, which are here, uh, you can read it. These are the coordinates on the color system that we showed, just, just saw. Um, so you basically, um, you, you, at least you get some similar colors, um, which is important. And um, yeah, you can, you can see like, like, uh, all the auto codes and like, there are pages, and pages of different variants for those LEDs. Um, okay, this, is, this was just like, and then we should say, okay, we have how bright it is, and we have the color temperature, what else should there be? Um, in fact, it's not, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Um, uh, these are, because the, the LEDs uh, don't emit like white light, like an even amount of, of uh, uh, light in the frequencies, but um, actually they're very uneven. You can see like those are different curves um, for this cold LED, which has uh, a lot of blue light in it. Um, um, basically, all the white LEDs are just blue LEDs um, with some phosphorus on them to convert the blue light to white light, which moves part of this energy to a longer wavelength. And depending on the on the chemics of the on the chemistry of the of the phosphorus uh, layer, you can achieve different color impressions. Um, so this is the medium. This is 6,500. This is 4,000 Kelvin, and this is 2,700, which is a warm white. But um, if this is uneven, this can interact with how we perceive objects illuminated by the light. And this is something you might have seen um, if you have, uh, say, say uh, a light bulb in your, in your cellar somewhere, in your storage room. Um, they usually have a very bad color rendition. Like, everything looks sort of weird. The colors don't look brilliant, and it's like not a nice light. And like the compact, the energy-saving lights, they also had not a very good color rendition, typically, and that's why people didn't like the type of light. They couldn't express why, but it, like, it's, it looked Things somehow look strange. Things look weird. Yeah. Um, and this is an example. Like, this gets us to the CRI, the Color Rendering, rendering Index. Um, I don't know if this can be seen. Yeah, from, this yeah, is a good can, display. OK, OK. Um, uh, look at the blue crayon. Those are two different lights with the same color rendering indexes, even, um, and with the same color temperature. Um, but the results, how objects look in this, are completely different. And this is, um, this is like what the CRI ha wants to say, even though they're, they're equal. Um, it doesn't mean that the lights are equal, but they're equally bad. Um, and CRI is one of the most voodoo and arbitrary metrics in all of this. So basically, CRI of 70 is already pretty bad. We'll get into it. 100 is perfect. It's really beautiful light. But so these are pretty bad lights, but they're bad in very different ways. This blue and this blue are just completely off, but it's the same picture. And it's very, very, very random. Um, and so how CRI is done, like how is this measured? We have a set of arbitrary chosen colors down here. And actually, it's only taken on the, the very basic version. It's just taken until this point. Those eight not really separated colors. And the idea is like, what would happen if we illuminate this with a perfect light? and with our light, whether we want to measure, and how, how far are they apart. That's the, the, the basic idea of the measure. Uh, later on, um, there were some colors added. Sometimes they use it, sometimes not, so it's not completely comparable. Um, and the idea behind it, or the reason behind it, is that this thing comes old like from 100 years ago and hasn't been changed since then. This is the, the months of colors with them. This is uh, like the colors are taken from them. It's just an arbitrary choice. Uh, they said, look, those are nice colors, let's use them. Um, they don't even mean something in realistic settings. And even the, the reference light, which would be perfect, um, is it's not just ar arbitrary, it's also culturally insensitive because it tries to reproduce noonday light in Western Europe. So, um, you know, if you're from somewhere else, that's not the typical light that you might have. Okay, what happens? Um, Let's try, I try to explain this. This is an experiment. I don't know if it's understandable or not. Um, this is the emission curve of the, the LED, that, the mid-white mid LED that we've just seen, which is, this is color spectrum from far blue to far red. Um, and this is like the, the distribution of, of light that comes out of this source. Um, this is a material, this is actually purple. Um, uh, it's called a remission line. Every color itself has also sp uh, specifics on how each individual wavelength is re-emitted or absorbed, depending on, well, on the color. 
And there are some, like, this is like not even sharp curve, but there's some, some cutters with like, like high peaks on this, and like they take, they're, they're different. Um, but the purplish color reflects a lot of the reds and purples, and it sucks up the, uh, the, the, the other side of the spectrum. It sucks up in between, and the bluish, they're slightly yeah. more like it's a reddish purple. Um, um, so what you do is you multiply this curve, to see in, which is the energy coming out of the light, and you multiply it with this, uh, which gives you the amount of energy that, is remain, that remains after, um, after the, it, it, it was, uh, well, it lit the, the object. Um, and these curves down at the bottom are, well, like approximations of our perception of colors. We have three different types of color sensors in our eyes. And these approximate those, like they're uh, the red type, the green type, and the blue type. And you, well, you might apply this with that, and then w say with the red curve, which gives you, and then you look at how much you integrated, um, and which gives you a number, like which is the amount that how much was our red, were our red uh, sensors triggered. You repeat that with green and blue, which gives us a color triple. Uh, or, or just a triple, they're, they're not in the CIA, they're not called red, green, blue, they're just called X, Y, Z. And then you convert it into a point in, of our chart, which is the red point. Like sometimes like, you have to well, do some color correction on that. Um, and we know from, from measuring with the ideal one, like it should be here, um, which gives us a difference. And this is the amount of error. Um, and you repeat that for all eight co test colors or ten colors, test colors, how much depends on that. And you just do, you just average them, which is the average badness of the light. Um, and then you say, you just assign it, like you just arbitrarily scale it and subtract it from 100 because we said 100 is the best. Um, the scale is, is um, yeah, it's arbitrary. It's like when they started in the 50s, 60s, they said like a fluorescent light should be around 50. Um, and no one really cared about this. No. Um, but, but I think the thing to remember is it is arbitrary, and what you think is if 100 is perfect, it's percentages, but it has nothing to do with percentages. It's just 100 minus the average distance from what it's supposed to yep. be to what it actually is. That's um, the next slide, the summary. Um, so it's like, yeah, we take F8, well, arbitrary chosen test colors. They're, they're not even good. Um, um, we average them. Um, and like the color choice is arbitrary. The, uh, the, the method, like they're taking the arithmetic uh, median of that is arbitrary. And the scale is also arbitrary. So it's like, yeah, it's just a number. Um, it works quite well for most sources. But it's, for example, it's possible to build a CRI like 95 lamp that works nice for the test colors, but works terrible for all other colors. It's possible. Um, and there are, meanwhile, there are better uh, alternatives. I'm not going to go, go into details. They usually take better colors and take, take a bit better calculation for them or a better uh, measuring method. Um, so this is the worst thing. It comes from the 1950s something. Um, uh, it's, so it's the worst thing that, we, uh, that, we, that could be there. But it's usually the only value that you get. And so um, if you don't want to start your own spectrometric measuring, you have to live with it. And actually, if you're not a total light nerd or a total math nerd and you want to understand how this works, basically what you need to remember is you want above 90 or, or good mm. solid um, LEDs. Yeah. Um, above 95 or towards 98, you probably wouldn't be able to afford it's, them anymore. They're it's it's that excellent. Um, 80 is the actual requirement for office illumination in Europe. And like, like um, the sodium lamps that you see on the streets, the yellowish ones, they have minus 44. That's about the worst light you can get. OK. Um, Mm -hmm. Skip the next one, more or less. Yeah, okay. Uh, we, we, yeah, just very short. No, we skipped, yeah. we skipped it. We wanted to think about like, what is good light, and there are many, many, many different uh, goals that we have. Um, yeah. And we just have to pick some. We come to that back later. What we're. Um, so, so now we've picked the LEDs. Um, we're not going to go into the circuitry around actually driving the LEDs. Um, but we basically need, from the outside, we need to connect our switch, our lighting system, our home automation system to our light bulb to be able to control it. Um, it's, a, you, it's just a tower of Babel of different standards at the moment. There's lots of stuff coming around. We're talking about mainly, we're going to talk about mainly the last mile, what's spoken from some sort of control unit to the light bulb. And we picked, um, 
three protocols. Two we implemented on, on, the, on the hardware we're going to demo. Uh, and one, uh, for some reason, we put it in the introduction, so we'll just go gr gloss over it quickly, uh, which is Zigbee, which was always the thing, like the wireless standard for home automation. But we've kind of found that nobody really uses this, nobody really cares about it, or at least we don't. Um, and we haven't really found a lot of people still using it, mainly because phones don't really have a Zigbee radio in it. Um, there's still like the one thing that, that, that defines automated lighting nowadays is the Philips U, and that speaks Zigbee. But nobody really speaks Zigbee with it. I mean, most people will just have a bridge device that, that speaks Zigbee internally. And um, if you want to deal with those devices, you would, it's just a REST API that you're using. So it's not really that, that interesting. Um, the second protocol that we're looking at and one that, that we're a little bit more in-depth and that, that we can create and that we can deal with is, oh, I can't really see it, DMX512. Uh, um, that's traditionally used for the sort of effect lighting you see around here for stage lighting for discos and things like that. But uh, it's being, now that lights are written and office lights and home lights are becoming more than just dimmable, um, it's also being used for more intelligent uh, controls and, and controlling color temperatures. Um, and it's basically, it's called uh, DMX512 because it's basically always just one string of 513 bytes. Um, there's one start byte and then there are just 512 bytes that define the state of the universe. And what the universe is depends on how you set up the universe. So if you have a bunch of RGB lights, those 512 bytes. The first three might be the R, G, and B bytes for, the, for that lamp, and the next three will be the R, G, and B for that lamp. If you have a smoke machine ha hooked up to your, uh, uh, to your DMX net, the fourth byte might then be the power of the fan for the smoke machine. It's up to the machine to decide uh, when it's hooked up. Uh, there's just one thing missing in this graph. Um, like they go continuously over, over the line, which is just our uh, 45 line. Um, before this, in order to say this is the start of a new frame, there's a long break, like the long zero period uh, that just basically violates the receiver so it knows that now it's going to repeat from the beginning again and then it goes over and over and over. Uh, and so basically for the lamp to know which of those 512 slot it gets, you have uh, in Germany you say Mäuse Klavier, so a mouse keyboard, uh, you usually have dip switches on, on the lights and they say, well, your slot, so-and-so. Um, and um, they have re-engineered a backwards compatible thing into that which is called RDM, Remote Device Management, which they uh, advertise as faster than a ladder, so you don't have to climb up and, and, and change the dip switches to, to reconfigure the lights. Um, you have a back channel where you can assign addresses to, to devices, and you can also query their status, which is nice. You can see if uh, a light bulb is broken and things like that, and you need that for office lighting as well. Um, the other protocol that we're, we're dealing with and this is one of the implementations that we did this year. Has, by the way, has anyone ever heard of Dali before? OK. Oh, wow, cool. almost everybody. OK, is that why you're here? <laughs> OK, <laughs> no. Uh, it's a really, really boring protocol in comparison to this. It's a very German protocol. There's thousands of uh, pages of, of uh, ISO uh, documentation that really define it into the, into the smallest details. And it just basically is just for dimming and turning on and off um, lights. So there's three main sections for it, one-on-one -on -one system with ISO specs. If there's like a system overview spec, don't buy that. Um, no, it's just the, it's the electrical, like the voltage levels and stuff like that. It's like yeah, low-level stuff on there. You can read that up on Wikipedia. I care. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, there's control gear and devices. So one is the switch side and one is the, one is the light bulb side. Uh, we're concerned with the light bulb. Uh, DALI is always not 512 or 513 bytes, it's always two bytes, and it's extremely slow. Can we turn them? No, probably can't, right? Um, the base uh, command is DAPC direct arc power control, so it's from a different time where you still had light arcs, um, where basically in the first byte, you would have an address for a device or a group of devices. And if the last bit of the address isn't set, then the second byte 
is just a, a, a dimming level from 0 to 254. Um, and that's the only command that has both an address and a value. Like, all the others just have one of them. Yeah. For all of the other devices, so, so these are starting with really basic, uh, basic commands. Um, you can turn a specific device or a group of devices off. You can turn it. Uh, you can make it brighter. You can um, turn it to its maximum level, minimum level. There's lots of these weird little subtle uh, commands. Uh, this table just goes on and on for all of the, the bytes, basically. There are a bunch of these uh, sort of commands that assign the different lights to, 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 to groups. Uh, you can do scenes because you only have two bytes and it's very slow. You try to configure uh, the whole system ahead of time. So you would say this is a theater and after the, uh, after the show, uh, all of the lights will slowly fade up. So you want to configure that and just say, okay, go to this scene, which will be lights slowly fading up. Uh, finally, there's a bunch of special commands. Um, those aren't addressed to any specific devices or groups, but they're set to the entire bus. So every, they're, they're sort of broadcast commands. Um, so all of these uh, 200 and over 250 commands have to be implemented by any DALI device, and they're very subtle and very strange, and it's, it's hard to understand what some of them are for. And that's not even color. That's just brightness, 250 commands just for setting a brightness of a lamp. And then there's a bunch of further um, ISO specs which deal with either uh, other lighting technologies that, need, that have specific requirements for them, or they deal with specific types of lamps, for example, that you want to be able to control, like the, the emergency exit signs. Those, are, those require a different set of commands. What, we're, uh, what we were dealing with is obviously in the bottom, DT, DT8, uh, which is color control, so you can, set, so you can precisely set the color of a, of a, of a light. Um, so typically it's two bytes, but for example, just to get a rough feeling of what DALI feels like, um, if we want to set a light bulb to 4,000 Kelvin, um, DALI doesn't work in Kelvin, it works in micro reciprocal degrees, so it's 1 million divided by Kelvin. Um, so we want to set it to 250. Um, we have 16-bit resolution in the color, so we will want to set it to 00 FA. That would be the, the bytes that we want to set it to. Um, because each command is only two bytes long. It's going to be hard to send two bytes because... So Dali has these things called data transfer registers. So we set the first byte into the first data transfer register and the second byte into the second data transfer register. And so these are broadcast um, commands and they get sent to every single light that's attached. Um, changing the light temperature has nothing to do with standard Dali, so we have to enable the device type 8, which has to do with color control. And just for good measure, you have to do that twice so you don't enable color control accidentally. Um, and finally, uh, this is the, the sort of standard type of command. We just put two stars there because then you would tell a specific device at the address to change to the color control and it's, it to change to the color temperature in its two registers. And this will also set the current color space of the device to uh, calibrate the color temperature. Oh, we'll hurry up and we'll do yep. so just a quick overview of, of DALI versus DMX. Both of them are on the board. Uh, DALI is a super old school protocol. DMX is a super old school protocol. They're very established. They've been around for a long time. They're pretty solid. Uh, DMX is fairly slow compared to like the Wi-Fi that we have here, but DALI is just incredibly slow. I mean, this is like slow in the late 80s already. Um, DMX has some, it's, it's RS485, uh, so you'll typically have some kind of UART uh, on, on your device that can, that can speak that. It's in a daisy chain configuration. You want it 150. Yeah, it's like it has to be impedance. impedance controlled and terminated and stuff like that. That's because of, well, the wires are relatively long in comparison to the bit rate. Um, DALI doesn't have that problem. It's so slow that you can ha hook up long, like, like coat hangers. It doesn't matter uh, which configuration. You can just choose an arbitrary topology. It doesn't matter. And you can have start topology mixed with daisy chains, mixed with whatever. Anything just kind of works. You can also put mains power into DALI. If you do that by accident, DALI has to be able to deal with it. So it's electrician proof and, and things like that. Uh, DM mixes 512 bytes that keep getting rebroadcast and, and that represent the state of the world. DALI is two bytes which have a specific meaning. 
um, the meaning of the 512 bytes depend on, depends on the devices in the world. Um, both have a back channel, one is an add-on, one is more for fixed installation, one was intended for slow lights, and the main sort of uh, difference is DMX has a smart controller, you'll have a big light setup. DALI has smart devices, and, and they maintain the states. So we have one of those devices that we built, and Matthias is going to yeah. show and demo that. It's, um, uh, we, we call it the Turbolite 3000, because it's better than the Turbolite 2000. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically it's, it's a device we didn't know which protocol to implement. We were always like like annoyed by like having st being stuck to one universe. So we built one device that has speaks multiple protocols. Um, and basically, this is the control board. Um, this is like in the background. You can see this is a modular structure. You can hook up uh, any sort of uh, electronic LED loads, and those are the modules. We you can just chain them together as long as you want. Um, so this one. Um, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, like, I, I guess you cannot see anything. I'll just go over this. There's, there's a power section. There's an ESP32 um, that is basically um, the module that you see here on your badge, same thing, which gives us Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE um, and, and a nice processor. Um, this is like the programming section, which is also on, on the board. Like, this is pretty standard. This is the interface for DMX. It's just the RS-485 receiver uh, or trans transceiver, which is the standard chip. You get that ready-made, so it's, yeah, one chip. Um, the only, well, say, interesting part is the DALI physical layer, because um, so DALI um, and, uh, I, I, yeah, but maybe someone will understand it. Um, the, the main thing is that DALI is physically isolated. So these are optical isolators. Um, the, the DALI circuit and the outside world are separated because it's, um, uh, because it can, um, um, this thing could be accidentally hooked to mains voltage, and this would break everything else, so it's isolated. Um, DALI um, basically has just two wires, and it doesn't matter which direction you put them in, so you have this bridge rectifier, which just sorts the, the positive and the negative side of this. Um, the DALI bus does not work alone. There's an external power supply um, that gives us around 16 volts on the bus. And the, the, the devices communicate by just shorting that bus to zero. Um, and the power supply is, 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 is limited, is current limited, so it doesn't burn when you do that. Um, and that way, everyone can just talk. And you see, this is like a, uh, this is a MOSFET that just shorts uh, this line to this line. And when it sh closes down, like it's shorted. Uh, so this is obviously the send part. Like the transmission comes in, is, is, is isolated here, and goes through this one, which can short those two wires. Um, and this is basically, um, we're allowed, when we're not shorting it to ground, we're allowed one milliamp to draw one milliamp to power our circuitry. And we use that. So this, this thing is like, it's a reference voltage. This is just a current mirror. Just to, uh, all, the, all, the, all the purpose of this is just to take, just take one milliamp from here and send it through this uh, LED, which will give us the indication of that the level is high. And when there's no voltage, uh, obviously, the LED cannot burn. Um, so um, that's basically the, how most of the DALI transceiver circuits are made. Um, you, if you wonder why these three resistors, in case you put mains to it, there's going to be a lot of energy, and we need to get rid of the heat. And that's why we just put in three resistors. Um, I think for the people who aren't total electronics nerd, the, they, they, they won't know this. Uh, these optocouplers are the thing that isolates the mains power from, from, the, from the actual circuitry. And these are actually little packages which we can show you on the board. And they contain an LED. And when there's a signal on here, this LED will go on. It's inside of the package. And there's a light sensor on the other side. So there's actually no electrical connection. There's just a light transmission in between there. And all of that's in a little package. And that's actually pretty neat. Uh, yeah. um, component electricity, there. light, electricity. There's no metal connection between the two sides. Okay. okay. Um, for the light board, uh, we're not going to show. Um, we're not going to show the, the schematics, like the circuit, but the board. Maybe you can see that. Like this is the, all the, the circuit that we have, and it's based on a boost converter that converts. We have 24, 12 so to 24 volts that come in, and this one converts it up to around 60 volts. That is there to power two strings of. Uh, of 12 LEDs each, and they, you can see they wind around like this was goes zigzag, zigzag, zigzag around. It winds in, um, and like there are two large string of LEDs, uh, one with cold light 
uh, cold LEDs and one with warm LEDs. Um, and what you can see also see is like um, everything is like a copper area here, and this is just to get out the heat of the of the LEDs. They each of them produces around half a watt of energy, and so we spread it to copper, which is a good, light, uh, good, good heat conductor, so we can just um, take this as a radiator and radiate it out, and it's like this spreads also to the other side, and so we spread even more energy. And we don't need a cooling body stuck to the back of the uh, modules. And we can see that we cheated. We actually cheated a bit. Like we want to have a tunable white lamp that can range from 2,700, which is our warm white LED, to 6,500, which is a cold white LED. And we're well. In order to do that correctly, we would have to move around this arc, but we don't. We're like we, we just interpolate between those two, uh, which gives us like sort of a bit of deviation here. Um, that's basically what many manufacturers do. In order to really follow the curve, you need more primary colors to mix from, uh, which makes everything more expensive and more effort. And we were lazy. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting to see that it's really this stupid. You just sort of, it's a linear mixing of coal. If you have one LED that's here and uh, one LED of this temperature, you just mix those linearly and you get something along a straight line. It doesn't, it's, not it's not as complicated as this whole color temperature thing is. You just sort of average the two lights. Yeah. So we're going to finally uh, do a demo of that. This is not, not really exciting. It's just an LED lighting up. But it's about the most complex way you can just uh, well, turn an LED on. Um, I will slowly dim it up because it's not, it's, it's not Wait, flashing. Wait, uh, just also the. Huh? So you can see these are the, the, the panels with the LEDs. Right now you can see the, the cold and the warm uh, lights. This is a Dali controller that's off the that's shelf. That's something you can buy off shelf and put into your room uh, and thing. Like we said, there's two power supplies. So there's this power supply, which actually produces the power for the, for the lighting. So it's a bigger power yeah. supply. And this is the one that the provides the power Dali to the, power supply, to which the is bus that gets also an off-the-shelf off device. And this is the control board in the middle of everything, um, and a pretty terrible setup. Um, and we can just uh, turn it more up, or just go up all the way. And this is, um, this is actually limited right now for development purposes to have all of the power that it can give, uh, just so that we don't destroy our modules. Um, and then you can turn the... Um, Turning from warm white to, to bright white, we didn't do um, um, we didn't do like the optics in front of them. We will, that that's supposed to mix the colors in between, and then you would just see an even surface. And we move them like like this, so you can see it, what's going to happen. One one last thing that's uh, what Dali is nice for. I dim it a bit down. Uh, Dali, since it's for for uh, uh, permanent installations, it has sort of failure modes. It can report when the lamps are broken. We have a back channel that reports that something's wrong with this module. And you can, for example, have settings what happens if the light control faults, uh, doesn't work anymore. Like, the, um, like, say, you have a, a staircase light um, that shouldn't be off and you cannot turn it on. So you can have a default level what happens when the bus fails. And it should detect that and go to full power. And that was it. So thank you very much for your attention. And if we want to have questions, we're around. If you want to have a look. So please go to the microphone when there are any oh, wow. questions that also the people in the stream can hear it. Mm. So have you played with ArcNet and OSC? Uh, we have done OSC, but not in relation with this lighting project yet. Um, that would be something like um, that you could probably do with a Wi-Fi connection on this. So we did a lot of work with uh, MIDI. And uh, that was always, that's usually the question that comes always, why don't you do OSC? Um, and so OSC would also be like, oh, yeah, two bytes of Dolly or like the first two bytes of an XML document. So we're not and, huge yeah. fans. Uh, no, OSC can do lots, lots of things, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's a complex protocol, uh, can do many things. And these are so trivial. The protocols are so simple that things tend to work out of the box, which is very nice. Uh -huh. You just inspired two more questions. Can you do RGB over Dolly? Uh, yes, you can. Actually, there are four different color spaces. Um, one is like just the controlled color temperature. The second one is the coordinates in the CIE, the, in, the, in the, the graph that I just showed. So it's, you can represent every color. And there are two that have up to six channels of different primary colors. Um, and you can support either of, of them. Although 
there are not many controllers on the market that con can actually control it. And there's not a lot of lamps that can actually display those colors. <laughs> okay, and what about wireless DALI? Is there something like that? Um, well, we had this sort of, where was it? Here with the logos, which sort of surprised us because that just showed up. Um, there probably will be something like that, and probably like the next generation of DALI won't be as nice as it was, or as reduced as it was, but we don't know. There's um, it's currently it's, not. There's something happening at DALI. It's like it, it was it was still for about five years, and then within the last year, I think there were two or three revisions of the standard, which is pretty annoying if you have to buy it again and again. Um, but um, there is discussion about moving from taking the protocol and moving it to another physical layer like wireless. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Next question. One of the problems with LED, if you have only one color, is that uh, we used to the old school uh, lighting bulbs that when you dim, you get warmer light. Mm -hmm. And with a LED, you get a grayish uh, mm -hmm. uh, vision because uh, yep. the, the level of uh, the light uh, goes down, and then we do not see enough color. Mm -hmm. um, in your device, do you bring up warm light when you uh, dim the light to uh, get opposite of that effect? That would be the next step. Like right now we have, um, um, in fact, this is one of the things where you can do with, uh, that you can do with this, because you can produce, well, bright light and, and dim light and warm light and cold light, and you just have to find a way that, like, saying, if it's dim, it should be warm, and if it's brighter, it should be colder, the light. Um, um, that's something that we intend to do in the firmware. Um, mm -hmm. There are some manufacturers that already do this. It's called like sunset or dynamic dimming or something like this. And dimming um, over red or giving more red when you dim. Right, then right. Which will make it like it, it will simulate the, the the behavior of of a traditional mm -hmm. lamp. Yeah. Um, and they they only expose one one channel, like the brightness channel that you mm -hmm. dim, and they automatically know that they should go to warmer colors when they're dimmed. And so that's something that we should do in the in the firmware. So when traditional incandescents got dimmed, the actual temperature of the tungsten got colder, so the color te the color temperature got warmer, and you simulate that by, by changing it when you mm. uh, yeah. but changing the, the yeah. But that's something that's gonna gonna emerge uh, sooner or later, and some manufacturers have, and there's something also something we want to do for this. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, how do you uh, connect? Uh, can you use any LED strip with it? Hey, with, pardon, uh, pardon. with your controller, can you hook up LED strips? Any, or is it special? Uh, the, the typical LED strips. Um, basically, you, well, you would need some sort of adapter. We're not into the, the LED strip thing too much because, well, they're fancy and you can do many, many colors, but they are usually at the CRI level of 70 and below. Um, and they, they don't, uh, we didn't go into the, the gold thing. They usually, like the, the typical uh, NeoPixel that you have on the batch, something like this, yeah. they typically have terrible dimming behavior. Like, they only have 8-bit dimming, so you cannot go below 5%. Um, so yeah. they're, they're nice for effect lighting, but they're not so good for reading yeah. room illumination. We bought um, a tunable white lamp uh, at the office to play around to, to see if we like it. Uh, yeah. um, and can we hook up your controller with it? Um, basically, yeah, there's a, there are extension ports. You could just put it like that, but then you could take whatever other controller you want. Um, yeah, it, it could be possible. But do you have information on, on the quality of the, of, the, uh, of the light strip that you have? Uh, I would be interested. Maybe we can discuss later on. Yeah. Well, cool. for example, if you have like a DALI system in your office, that could hook up to this. The controller uh, would need sort of a driver for your specific LED on there. But it's a general purpose controller, so it would be able to, if it just needs to send out a stream of, uh, like, like the, the, the RGB light strips, where you just sort of push oh. out a stream of bits, you could write a backend or a driver for that specific um, hardware. Yeah. Uh, by the way, is, is, is that, are these individually addressable, or are these overall, like, one color strips? Um, well, the, the lamp specifically has multiple strips on the top and on the bottom, and I think yeah. it's two strips. Uh, yeah, one for brightness and one to mix in some yeah. uh, okay. tunable warmth stuff. Okay, let's discuss that later. Later yeah. on, just come on over. I would love to play around with one okay. of these uh, things on it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Next question, please. Um, in terms of protocols, I wonder, do do you have you looked at Bluetooth Low Energy? What future does it have? 
Uh, no one actually knows. Um, <laughs> I, I guess there's a, there's a battle going on between different low energy RF modes to control lighting or to get like the smart home leading in that area. Um, we have done quite a couple of Bluetooth low energy projects, not in in relation with light yet. Uh, and no one really knows where the path is going to be, but that was one of the reasons why we chose the ESP32, like the, the controller module, because it also has Bluetooth LE. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, Bluetooth LE, I, I personally like it. Um, yeah. And so we, we want that to win, but and, no and one generally knows. on the market with Bluetooth 5, people who are using Bluetooth, um, there's a mesh mode, so that's a lot more appropriate for, for lamps as well, that they can talk to each other as well, and not just with the host. Right. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a thing that is coming up in the market, whether that will survive. But I think it's more viable than Zigbee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Next question, please. Um, the DMX, uh, I believe it's um, a little arbitrary, the, the way that you organize the, the network. Um, but the Delhi, uh, as it's, uh, everything is, um, um, uh, has been standardized, it begs the question, if you are controlling the power level, uh, monitoring the power level of the installation, and at the same time you can uh, manipulate all the signals, could you map with uh, that Dali controller and uh, looking at the same time for the power consumption to map the entire uh, installation? Um, use it as a scanner for, for the electrical installation, for example. For, for a DMX uh, installation? No, 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 not for DMX. DMX is too arbitrary. But as Delhi is standardized, the, the items, you could do, um, make a, 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 a variation matrix and see if, if it, uh, things are going, uh, if the power levels are going up, that you have something there. And uh, it could be used to map a building, for example, with the LAVI installation, uh, with the DALI installation. Um, DALI has some features like that, and you would be able to, I mean, you can immediately query devices and get their oh. serial numbers and their, and, and, and their make and model and things like that. Um, whether you, and, and what we would like to also use this device for is a, as a DALI test uh, device, that you can test DALI devices to see if they conform to, to the specs and, and, and run, uh, run arbitrary test strings and sequences of uh, so that kind of it goes in that direction, I think, to sort of reverse engineer the lighting yeah. setup of a, um, of a building would, would probably be pushing it. I mean, you might be lucky if, if you have a building like this and you know you have 10 uh, lamps and then it can just go through them and you would have some software to say, okay, front left is that one, and it would yeah. iterate through all the lamps until you find the one that you're looking for. Something like that would be yeah. possible, yeah. Okay. Next question, please. So I just Googled uh, Turbo Light 3000, and I didn't find anything. Do you have this on sale as a kit? Um, it's, it's a world premiere now. And it's a world premiere. <laughs> In fact, I, I finished the board the night uh, before we left to, to ah. this place. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we try to uh, set up something online, but, but if not, contact us and we, we can talk about it. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in this sort of thing and you work with lights, definitely we would be happy to have somebody who uh, understands the protocols, a little bit of electrical and firmware programming. Uh, we would love to have you as like a beta tester when, when we have some more samples, yeah. Awesome, I also wanted to add a comment about Bluetooth. Okay. Um, a company used to work for, did a consumer product with 80,000 sold units and had the 50% failure rate for setting up Bluetooth on Android phones. Whoa. Yeah, so it's not ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Next, please. I think one uh, quality that's often overlooked is the frequency of the pulse width modulation right, right. when it's dimmed. Which frequency did you choose? and? Did you also consider the effect on uh, people, older people, and maybe even animals, uh, birds, dogs? We didn't. We picked a really shitty frequency, and that's a little demo I think we can um, do. Yeah. Uh, this is right now. Um, uh, the, why we choose this, this module is that um, you can go, there's a trade off between the dimming frequency, uh, the PWM frequency, and the lowest rate you can achieve, because you cannot do arbitrary short pulses of energy. Um, and so we, uh, this is currently running at three kilohertz, uh, dimming, which allows us to go down, like to have a, a have a ratio of what is it, one by one thousand or one by ten thousand? I don't know, uh, something like that. Let me calculate it later on. Um, 
Uh, right now we hit a very bad spot and maybe we can show it, see if it goes on, yeah. Can you hear it? It, like, it makes noise right now. Uh, That's audible noise, that would be something um, that we have to tweak on, on the frequencies on that. Uh, it's not tuned yet. Um, it was more important for me not to go down with the dimming, with the PW frequency of a light to get flicker and like these uh, uh, subconscious effects out of out of the lamp. Um, might maybe we, if, we, if we want a higher dimming ratio, we could go individually down with the dimming uh, frequency for very very low values, which is usually yeah rarely used. Okay, two minutes left. Last question, please. Yeah, actually, I have two questions. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, the first one was with the uh, Dali transmit receive circuit. Why did you short out the uh, the power supply? Uh, because that's what you do. That's the that's way you send works. data. Uh, it's yeah. actually it's, it's a Manchester coded bitstream, and uh, you short it you short it down to ground. The uh, the Dali power supply is a is a voltage and current limited uh, power supply. Um, like uh, it's it's 16 volts idle, and if it, if you have more than 200 milliamps, it should go down to zero. So uh, it it's either voltage or current limit. This is like um, high voltage always. Pulled down when someone is through to mid. This is like I square C on steroids. Okay, so it's a standard thing, so I probably yeah. should. This is the intended that. way That's to do it. To be. Okay. And the second question is a little bit fluffy. Um, for public light installation, I'm looking at uh, LEDs. They're officially ultraviolet, but they have a center, freak, center uh, wavelength of 405 uh, nanometers. Would you consider that ultraviolet, or will I run into problems with certification or, or uh, safety Concerning stuff? Concerning the blue light hazard, there is no uh. official regulation, there, the, but there are rumors that there will be in upcoming in the next years. I see. Okay. okay that was all. Thanks. Then once again, a warm applause for our two speakers. Thank you.